Welcome to another episode of the Financially Free Investor, where you will learn information and strategies on how to become financially independent by investing in real estate, something that is not taught openly in our society today. Financial freedom matters so you can live a bigger life, retire early, and do what matters most to you. Get ready to hear tried and true methods to becoming financially free with your host, Jordy Clark. All right, everyone, welcome into another episode of the Financially Free Investor. I'm super excited about today's episode. Uh, we have a mentor of mine, uh, Pat Hyben on. Pat, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jordy? Dude, I am outstanding. Thank you. Um, so guys, Pat, uh, I'll have him give maybe just a high level overview of, of what he's done, just so you guys are aware. But um, I actually stumbled into Pat Hyben close to nine years ago. He wrote a book called Six Steps to Seven Figures um, and just helping real estate agents get more traction, do more business and just kind of started following him along. And then I joined GoBundance a couple of years ago. Um, so he just wrote a new book, which is why we're bringing him on. And the new book is called The Quitter's Manifesto. And, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of this quiet, quiet quitting movement going on and, you know, people working from home. And um, I think this book is going to resonate with a lot of people because if you're not happy with what you're doing, probably shouldn't be doing it. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Pat, um, welcome in. I'm super excited to have you. Thanks, Jordy. It's good to be here, brother. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe maybe jump in and give people a little bit of a overview of, of who you are and how you got started on your journey to financial freedom and then kind of where you're at today. Yeah, that's that's a great question. How did you get started on your journey to financial freedom? Yeah. Um, all right. So start off with who I am. My name is Pat Hyben, uh, 56 years old. I live in outside of Charleston, South Carolina. I'm originally from Maryland. Um, you know, got a degree from college in sociology. I uh, got like a 2.3 GPA. I didn't have uh, much direction or know what I wanted to do. Really couldn't get a job uh, that was decent. So I took a job uh, in real estate sales. There's no barrier to entry there. So um, I jumped on it and became a real estate agent full time. That lasted a good 25 plus years, uh, you know, did a lot of bouncing around, ups and downs, had a mortgage company, title company, real estate brokerage, many different things. Um, then I got out around 2011, 2012, kind of sold off to my uh, to my best agent, my, my partner, Mike Sloan at the time. And then I um, wrote Six Steps to Seven Figures. I um, did a couple of other uh, projects or companies, let's call them, that basically ended up in the trash can. It was just money spent and that nothing, nothing positive came from them other than uh, experiences and lessons, I guess. And uh, eventually stumbled upon uh, Tim Rode and David Osborne, who we started GoBundance together. Also stumbled upon uh, Andrew Cushman and we started DAPT Acquisitions together. Uh, currently, DAPT Acquisitions has over 2,000 apartment unit doors. Um, uh, GoBundance has, uh, you know, 781 members as of today uh, in, in the male category and like another 120 women um, and uh, is, is thriving almost 10 years in the making. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I live with my wife. We've been married almost 30 years, coming up on our 30th anniversary. We have two adult children, both girls. And um, that's about who I am. I would say, how did I, how did I start uh, building financial freedom? I think, you know, by saving a dollar, basically. I think at first I just started saving money. It's all about saving money. I'm kind of reminded these days, actually, about the olden days of, of just saving money because I'm more in the saving mode as of lately. Um, but I just started saving money, right? Started earning money and then saving it. I think that's where it all starts. And then I started investing it. And I invested, played Monopoly, essentially, so invested in this little greenhouses, um, sold a bunch and bought the big red hotels. Um, and... Um, 
the rest is kind of history. And, and, you know, from there, um, became, uh, more diversified with, with investing in some various companies and investing in some other funds, some loans, uh, different things like that. But, uh, today I'd probably say I'm 60% real estate, 40% alternative assets. Awesome. Awesome. And man, as you're describing kind of your life, what, what an awesome tribute to you. You've been married to one person for a very long time. You, you've d- kind of woven in and out of a bunch of different stuff. And so, I mean, I guess we'll just segue straight into the book, The Quitter's Manifesto. I, you've quit a few things on your journey, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so why did you write the book, The Quitter's Manifesto? And and who is it meant for? Yeah, that's that's a funny question, kind of um, like, you know, I didn't really realize I was a quitter until I really started thinking about it right in the middle of COVID. You started reading articles about the, you know, the, the quitter generation or whatever they want to call it, right? The great resignation. Uh, people were and are uh, able to leave jobs a lot faster and a lot sooner than they ever have been in the past. And um, I started thinking about it and I said, you know, you know, my, my business partner, Tim road was the actual one who was my mentor in quitting. Like the first day I met him, um, I said, what do you do? And his answer was I ski. And, and it kind of frustrated me because I was like, who is this clown? Right? Like, like, why would he say such a stupid thing? And then, um, you know, after I got to talking to him, it was, you know, yeah, well, I have a bunch of rental properties and I, I have all this horizontal income coming in so that I don't have to work. And I was like, that's brilliant. And it probably took me six or seven years after that. But I think eventually this is when I, I, got, I got out of the real estate game and, and he helped me with that. He helped me understand that it is that I, that I wasn't a, a fool for doing it and that that. It, it was an okay thing to do. And, um, and then I did a couple of other things, you know, I had a podcast, um, where I did 850 episodes of it, real estate rock stars. I sold that to another go Bundance brother, Aaron and Mucha Stegi. Um, I quit that, you know, I just quit it cold Turkey. Um, and, and, and there's been other things that I've quit just because they, you know, they haven't worked, um, or, or I've gotten a good price for them and sold, and you could say that I quit. Um, but I've always found that it's quitting is not a bad thing. You know, I quit real estate uh, properties all the time, which kind of shocks some people. They're like, hey, you know, don't sell. Or, you know, if you sell 1031 it, and I'm like, no, I'm just going to sell and keep the cash or maybe invest it in something, maybe not. Um, but right now, my decision is just to quit and see what happens, or quit that quit owning that property um you know i i have this joke with my wife i'm like we we're never going to know whether the decisions we make to quit things or sell things or buy things are the right decision until we're like 99 years old right because you there's you who knows what happens right you don't know what's going to happen in five years or 10 years or whatever when you look back on things so um you're not going to know till you're like 99 and sitting on the front porch of a mobile home, like, and some little kid comes and asks you and you tell them. Um, so, so if it makes sense, go ahead and quit today and see where the unit, what the universe brings you. So that's my long winded answer to both those questions. Gotcha. And, you know, I really like that. And, and, you know, I'm assuming you guys wrote the book for, to make it okay for people to quit because in our society, it's like, well, you can't quit. Like, like you said, you can't, you can't sell that rental property. You know, everyone thinks that you have to buy it and hold on to it for 30 years or even primary residences, right? Like this is my dream home. And you know, I've, I've never believed in the dream home because life changes and. Yeah. And a dream home is, is subject to your circumstance that time in life. I mean, we had a, when we were raising our kids, we had a dream home that was, like in a good neighborhood and and a good school district and uh, good friends for them, their same age. And I think that was a dream home for them. And that was a dream home for us. Um, But for our, for what we're doing now, we live in a dream home and it's a lot, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, a fifth of the size of that one. 
Um, so it's just subjective, you know? Um, but yeah. So anyways, uh, what people don't understand is they get, they get quitting and they get giving up mixed up. Quitting is not giving up. Quitting is just making a decision, uh, that's, that you're going to move on to something better. Yeah. Why should somebody quit? Well, because they're not happy, I think. Um, or, or, or there's something else out there that will make them happier, uh, which will lead to all kinds of benefits being happy. Um, so Tim and I created this thing called a soul sucking audit in the book. And basically what it is, is we ask, so we asked, there's five things in the soul sucking audit and I'll go through them, but um, they, they basically, you can't get a six or a, or less on the soul sucking audit on, on average. And if you get six or less, then you know that you need to quit. If you get more than six, you know, you might want to stay in your job because it's a good job. We're not, so we're not trying to get people to quit we're not trying to inspire people who hadn't thought about quitting to quit because the majority of human beings shouldn't quit we're only talking to that really small percentage of people who want to quit who really should quit who complain about their job or complain about their boss to other people and other people tell them you ought to quit but they don't Mm. We're just talking to those people only. It's not an inspirational book. It's not a motivational book. We're not trying to create subjects that don't exist. Um, now, there are people that don't know, and that's why we uh, created the Soul Sucking Audit. So the Soul Sucking Audit basically, you, you know, takes you into the present, modern day, right? Um, how is your job regarding the compensation, meaning how much money do you make? Right. Does it paying the bills plus a lot? Um, is, or, or do you feel like you're getting paid what you're worth? Um, is, is it creating a good circumstance for you in life? Right. A prosperous circumstance. Uh, the second item is your respect, your respect for yourself. And do you feel like you're respected by the other people that you work with? Uh, the third is your fit for the team and your organization. Like, how do you fit in? Do you feel like one of them? Do you feel like an outsider, an insider? You, you know, does it make you comfortable, uncomfortable? That's very important. Your next one is your prospects for growth. Like, are you going to be the CEO? Are you going to own a portion of this company someday? Are you going to, you know, reach high levels in this company that you want to reach in a short period of time, in a short enough period of time? What are your prospects for growth? Do you have any? And then the last one is, and this is the most important, but how do you feel every morning about facing the day? Mm. And so we ask you to basically take this soul sucking audit. We tell a story in there about there's this fertilizer salesman and he goes to a farmer to sell some fertilizer and he's trying to sell the farmer on this fertilizer and there's a hound dog laying on the ground and the hound dog is, is like howling laying on the ground howling and the salesman goes, well, what's wrong with that dog? And he goes, the farmer goes, he's laying on a nail. And the fertilizer salesman says, well, why the hell doesn't he get up? And the farmer says, well, I guess it's not hurting him enough. And that that's what we're trying to get across. There's a lot of people who are laying on that nail that are complaining and hate it and moaning, but the nail is not sharp enough for them that, to move on so we're trying to get them to think okay let's let's sharpen the nail let's sharpen that nail and try to see if you're you know really should be out of there yeah so and i love that story you know i was thinking about it a lot um and and just you know reflecting back on me and and kind of where i'm at in life and um what would you say to somebody who has been, you know, at their career, they've been doing well, they get paid well, and they'd be like, maybe they're sixes across the board on the soul sucking audit. Mm -hmm. um, but they just don't know how to let go of that identity of wow. whatever they're doing, because that's the hardest part, actually. You, you're making it sound like that's like an, uh, um, an 
obscure thing that maybe is part <laughs> part of part of Jordy almost. I feel like it's it's a personal question. Like, um, but that's actually the hardest thing. Tim and I are actually we did this thing for Bigger Pockets, and um, we you know there was like two thousand books that were pre sold. And we said, you know, if you pre-sell, you get into like a group coaching call with Tim and I, they, the bigger pockets pick 10 winners out of 2000. And so we've been meeting with those 10 winners on this group coaching call. And that is the number one thing we're learning <clears throat> just recently is the identity is like in the way so much like in this call there's there's only 10 winners, but we have a doctor, we have a, a, a high, highly paid nurse, we have an engineer we have a lawyer like like you know we have some really big identities like you sit next to him on the plane what do you do i'm a personal injury lawyer you know i'm i you know i'm i'm, I'm a anesthesiologist or whatever like that's a huge identity and i think that the funny part is tim and i have always struggled with identity i think like you know i guess at some level like, are you happy saying that's your identity? I get most of the people on this call would probably think, like the lawyer would probably think, yeah, I'm a lawyer, but I don't know why I got into law. <laughs> you know, my, my identity was was real estate. I, I don't know why I got into real estate, right? I never liked like, oh, this is a great kitchen or this is a great bathroom. I just like the money and the commissions and the and the ability to work for myself and not have a boss. Yeah. It was but, more of a means to an end, I think. Okay. So, so yeah, I, to answer your question, how do you get over that identity? You just got to figure that you, that, that that's all it is, is an identity. It's all in your head. You're the only one with that identity. There's certainly a million doctors that have quit and become real estate investors or something completely different like the doctor in our group this is what i said to him i said do you think there are any other doctors who have created an identity as big as yours or bigger of being a doctor that have quit and gone on to do something else and he said sure hmm. like of course i'm sure there's thousands and thousands of them right he might not know any any of them but he could probably find some. We've got, you know, a couple in our uh, in GoBundance. There's, you know, Tom Byrne wrote, Tom Burns from GoBundance wrote a book, uh, Why Doctors Don't Get Rich. He's got a whole following now of doctors that, you know, want to quit. But but anyways, my point is you're not alone, even though you probably feel that you're alone. Like he probably had anxiety thinking he's the first doctor ever in American history to to quit to go do something that he likes better. But this, this I'm sure that I'm guarantee you there's tons of them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, uh, one of my really good friends, Rob, um, he used to be an orthopedic surgeon mm. and it's kind of the same thing. He, he quit being an orthopedic surgeon. And um, I, I can imagine that having gone through, you know, what, four years of medical school, how many ever years of residency and then, you know, that's being a doctor or lawyer. That's something that, you know, in our society, it's always preached, like go to school so you can get a good job so that you can, you know, become this prestigious person. And, you know, if you read millionaire next door, you know, most of the times those people are just spending everything they're making. And, and the, the point I'm getting to is your identity after such a long period. And, and, and this is why I asked the question, because you were a realtor for 25 years um, your identity for so long gets wrapped up in what you do, but that's mm -hmm. not who you are, right? Yet, I think that's probably the hardest part of people quitting is, like you said, letting go of that identity to step into whatever's next for you. Yeah, and, and here's where people get it wrong, Jordy, and I love this conversation. Where they get it wrong is they think that if they cut off that identity, then it means they have to go all the way back to when they're 17 and a half years old and start over again before they went to med school or, or doctor school. But, but it's so far from the truth. Literally, you can quit and fail and fail again. And worst case scenario, you just go back to what you're doing and the people will welcome you with open arms and you could just pick right back up as an orthopedic surgeon. You know what I mean? You could 
you could start all over if you wanted. Like it's, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon, so you're really going back to like a two hundred thirty thousand dollar a year job if you fail over and over again. You know, but people compartmentalize it and they they think the worst. Like, yeah. like we found that we talk about it in the book where people like we, we, we say, Hey, it's so scary quitting. And people, we ask people, why is it so scary? And they go, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to end up homeless and my kids are going to be starving and I'm going to live in my car and my house is going to get repossessed and all these bad things are going to happen. But in reality, chances are none of that stuff would happen. You know, they would the worst case, they would just start all over they would start back where they left off. Mm. We just tend to over amplify things. Yeah. No, it's so good. And and I love reframing that, you know, if someone's debating quitting, really their worst case scenario is they go back to their current day-to-day scenario. So man, that's good. Um, well, in the book, you guys talk about how to quit. Um, you know, you you build some nets and trapeze, maybe speak to the nets that people can can build if they're interested in quitting. And of course, I want to encourage everyone that's listening to go grab a copy. It's published by Bigger Pockets. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Audible. Um, but maybe maybe speak to that a little bit, Pat. So we like in the entire book, this is, um, first of all, this book is not a, a strategic book. It's not an inspirational book. It's only a tactical book. And what that means is it's a step-by-step process. If you're ready to quit, here's how you do it. Here's how we recommend you do it so you don't fail. And if you do fail, you don't fail massively. And we liken it to a circus, like a trapeze event at a circus where the trapeze artists, instead of just like jumping off of a diving board onto the dirt, they're, they build a safety net. So if they fall that they bounce off the safety net. And when they swing, they have a trapeze bar to grab onto. And so we teach you how to build a safety net and we teach you what the trapeze bars are. And so like each chapter in the book, is like a tool that's essentially a trapeze bar so that you could literally go to that diving board in the circus and instead of diving off and landing in circus dirt, you have a trapeze net, you have these bars, you get over to the other side and you quit successfully. And um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, building the safety net. This is tool number seven that we give. And um, the first thing we tell you to do is get real. And this is like, get real with your expenses. Like some people ha- do not pay any attention to their numbers. And this is one of the cool things about abundance and the one sheet you know, we're really looking at the numbers and what your real numbers are. You know, what, how, how many streaming services do you have and what do they add up? You know, how many apps in, on your iPhone or Android do you have? Are you paying for and what do they add up to be? What, what are all of your exact expenses? What are your savings? You know, what do you have, you know, invested all that? What's your net worth? How much are you, what's your burn rate? Like how much do you burn through in 30 days? Realistically average the last 12 months, you know, Um, let's just get real, real, real about what your numbers are. And then the second thing we want you to do is get credit now, which means start building that safety net of cash so that you don't panic right away and that you have a buffer and the way we recommend doing that is number one, you get a loan. You get you get multiple loans. You can get a HELOC loan on your home equity, which means you can take out your home equity loan. And we actually recommend in, in today's time that you get a, a home equity loan, that you actually take the full amount out and you put it in a separate bank account different from the bank that gave it to you. Because what's happening is eventually these house prices are going to drop. And inevitably what, what goes on with these HELOCs is the banks then – shorten the amount that you could borrow. So if your HELOC's 100 grand, all of a sudden they might send you a letter that says it's now 50. Well, if you've already taken that money out, they can't. They're not allowed to do that. So, you know, you've got that money. So we uh, we encourage you to take it out, um, get things like more credit cards, get things like overdraft accounts, um, private loans, and, and, and figure out 
how many months of burn you want saved up, meaning how many months of expenses do you want saved up? Some people want three, some people want 12, uh, some people want five years. You got to figure out what you're comfortable with, but set that as a goal and then save that up and get this together so that you have that safety net. Don't just go out there and jump, right? And figure out that you have it. We we need you to make it specifically. And we talk about that in detail in that chapter. Yeah. No, and that's so good. I, I love the, the credit lines because so often people associate, you know, credit cards with a negative connotation. And it, it mm. certainly can be, yet you can also use them as a tool, right? Like there's so many out there that are 0% interest for 18 months or whatever. And, it, you know, yeah, you want to use the cash if, if you're jumping ship and you have a gap and whatnot, you want, you want to use cash like you were saying, but then having, you know, an extra 30, 40, $50,000 in a credit line that if you absolutely burn through all of your cash, you had to use, like that's, that's not the worst thing in the world, especially if once you get to the other side of it, you know, you're making more, you're showing up as, you know, whatever your new identity is, you're doing what you really enjoy, because that's probably where the gas is going to go on the fire. And you're not only going to enjoy life way more, but you're going to make probably way more money. Right. So uh, I love that because so many people automatically discount that because we're just taught, you know, don't do this. But you guys are reframing it and saying, hey, this this can be a tool if you choose it to be. Um, and you're almost saying, Hey, get the boat as close to the dock as you can before you jump. Don't, mm. don't just jump and try to make the boat right. when that's right. possible. Right. Yeah. 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 Or have some inner tubes in between or something that you could, you know, step on. I mean, do it right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the truth be told, like I said before, is most people won't do it out of fear. And that's why they're still stuck in their job. That's why they haven't done it. So all we're trying to do is help alleviate that fear as much as we can. Yeah, I love it. And I love the tactical steps that you guys give people because uh, it's that kind of stuff. Plus, you know, the other idea is that really it's not that hard and mm -hmm. and it's it's pretty easy to be able to quit and go do what you really enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, well, maybe let, let's just wrap up with the IO quotient. Um, can you explain to us a little bit about that? Because that's also in the book. Um, Absolutely. It, it, you, you know, it, we've we plagiarized this uh, certainly a little bit, but we, we've given him credit. Um, there's a business philosopher, uh, Nav Naval Pravakant. I don't know if you've uh, read any of Naval's stuff, but yeah, yeah. He, sent, he sent out a tweet that said, um, question, um, how much of your day is spent in interest versus obligation? And uh, Tim and I love that tweet. And we're like, holy dirt, like interest versus obligation. Like when Tim said, I ski, he's an in interest, right? Uh, but there's other things that he does where he's an obligation, but he's probably an extremist. Like he's probably 5% obligation, <laughs> 95% interest, right? And a lot of people would say that's selfish, right? But he, but that's just how he lives his life. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that, that his mother actually told him one day, you know, when are you going to grow up? And he was like 48 years old. Um, so like, you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, it's something to really think about on the regular, like you, just because it's work doesn't mean it's obligation, right? If you love doing it, you know, if it's, if it's singing to your soul, then it's certainly interest, right? The key is doing something of interest, but also, uh, you know, making a decent amount of money. And I know there's a double standard in our societies, um, you know, where, you know, it's, it's easier for a woman to say, um, you know, I'm going to follow my heart and do what, I love to do. And it's harder for a man to do that. It just it is what it is. Hopefully that will change. But, um, uh, but right now, if little Susie brings home, you know, three different guys and one is pre-law and the other two are, you know, um, elementary school gym teacher and, uh, uh, you know, garbage worker or whatever that they're going to be mom and dad are going to be pushing the, the, the pre-law. It just is what it is. It's, um, so, so it's harder, I think, 
but it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean it can't exist. And so we're trying to figure out a balance between how do you quit, do something you love that you also make a, 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 a great amount of money so that you can have a good life with. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it, it totally does. And I, I love that because I think so often we get, we get caught up and busy with life and work and kids and everything that we do that we don't sit back and take stock of, man, do I really enjoy what I'm doing? Right. And that can change as the years go. Um, because at the end of the day, like, you know, the, the one thing that uh, I think you and Tim embody is you guys are living a life that you're choosing versus one that you kind of just are bopping along and it, it, whatever happens happens, right? Like you guys are pretty mm -hmm. intentional um, in, in the fact that you're, most of your time is spent where you want to spend it. And I think that's opposite of most of America because I think mm. most of America is stuck in that obligation where, you know, mm. you, you have to pay bills because, you know, maybe people haven't financially set themselves up to get horizontal income. Mm. And, and so, and then that th those are the people that, you know, in 40, 50 years, they're just miserable. It, it, like, I was, I just got off a call with uh, Rich Fetke and he lives in Malibu and he's like, dude, there's a ton of people here that are super rich, but they are not wealthy because they are miserable. Right. So I, I just, I think that you guys are the perfect people to write this because you, you have recreated yourself a couple of times and Tim has done what he's always done, which is be outside getting the goods in the woods. Right. Mm, yeah. So, um, you know, more than anything, I just wanted to thank you for writing this book because uh, there's some stuff that I'm looking to, you know, maybe shed some obligation time in my day uh, mm. and and be focused more on the interest. Mm. Um, and, and you guys' book is is phenomenal so far. It's super short, too. So it's very tactical. Well, thanks for saying that. And it sounds like you're a great, great candidate for, you know, a great uh avatar for someone who who will enjoy the book so uh, thanks for being that and thanks for having me on today i appreciate it yeah absolutely um so pat if people want to find out more about you where can they go and then where can they order the book sure so we're just sending people to one website to keep it uh easy um it, and and that is quittersmanifestobook.com. That's quittersmanifestobook.com. You can get the book everywhere if you just Google it, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Bigger Pockets. But if you go to quittersmanifestobook.com, there's a, a coaching thing we have on there. If you want more coaching, uh, the, the book links are on there. Little contact information for me and Tim are on there, all that good stuff. Okay. Awesome. Quittersmanifesto.com then. Quittersmanifesto um, book. Book. Yes. Quittersmanifesto book. Okay. Cool. Well, with that, I want to be uh, sensitive to your time. So thank you for coming on, Pat. It was good chatting with you for a little bit and hopefully people go get the book. Thanks, Jordy. Yep. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Financially Free Investor. If you found value in this episode or know someone who would find value in this information, please share with them, subscribe, and send us a review.